young woman's body in the back of a burning car. She was probably still alive when they set fire to the car. She has been raped and tortured. She was subjected to horrific sexual crimes. They quickly arrest two violent offenders, Stephen Unwin and William McFall. How are they allowed to meet up and commit this awful act of violence? One in five murders in the UK is now committed by an ex-prisoner. From serial rapists, he harboured dark thoughts about carrying out sexual offences. To convicted killers. They'd met in prison. They were out on the streets together. Free to walk amongst us. They knew he could have killed again. Free to murder innocent people. She stabbed him many times. And then she hid him in a wheelie bin. I'm Donald McIntyre. And I'm examining how such tragedies happen. Who's to blame? Is it the justice system? Or are these killers just pure evil? She gained pleasure from hurting people. And ultimately, could an innocent life have been saved? This is Release to Kill. Stephen Unwin is born in 1978. He grows up in Houghton Le Spring, a town near Sunderland in the northeast. With the closure of the local coal mines, the town has fallen on hard times. Where there is deprivation, there's going to be crime. His youth is marked by drug use and petty crime. He racks up a string of burglary offences, breaking into homes with no consideration for his victims. Certainly he was trying to get money to buy drugs, and that's what fueled his crime, which then escalated into much more serious crime. Whether in an attempt to cover his tracks or simply because he got a kick out of it, he graduates to arson. And fortunately for the occupant, neighbours raised the alarm and got the fire brigade out. His next victim is not so lucky. In the early hours of Christmas morning, 1998, Unwin is looking to make some easy money. He breaks into the house of terminally ill retired pharmacist John Greenwell, who is 73. He was trying to find items he could carry away to sell to buy drugs. But as Unwin ransacks the house, Mr. Greenwell disturbs him. After smashing in the pensioner's skull, Unwin stabs him in the chest. He makes off with the old man's TV in a wheelie bin before coolly returning to collect the video recorder. And Unwin set three seats of fire to cover his crime around Mr. Greenwell's bungalow, one of them being right next to him. And then he escaped and left the place to, uh, to burn down. Unwin's long criminal record leads police straight to his door. There, they find the stolen TV and video and immediately arrest him. Stephen Unwin is convicted of murder and sentenced to life. The judge notes the viciousness of the crime and the previous offending. But because the judge has decided the murder was not premeditated and Unwin shows remorse by pleading guilty, he receives life with a minimum tariff of 12 years before he can be considered for parole. Stephen Unwin is sent to HMP Swaleside, a Category B prison on the other side. He meets William McFall, who's also serving a life sentence. Born in 1967, McFall grows up in Northern Ireland, on the outskirts of Belfast in County Antrim. It's a time of violent clashes between Catholics and Protestants. McFall, just like Unwin, has a string of serious offences to his name. He had a criminal history of arson, robbery, firearms offences. This was a violent man. On May 5th, 1996, McFall picks a frail and vulnerable victim to rob. He brings the home of 86-year-old Martha Gilmore who lives just a few houses away from him. And he broke into her house and killed her with a hammer. Probably because she recognised him and he wanted to cover his tracks and get away with it. Killing his elderly neighbour was an act of pure evil. 
And just like Unwin, McFall receives a life sentence with a 12-year minimum to serve. What is it about these two men that leads them both to commit such similar and cowardly murders? Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Shahom Das and former senior probation manager Adrian Smith join me in the Crime Hub to discuss the case. Have you come across cases like this where the perpetrator appears to commit a minor crime and then have no regard for escalating it into such a violent and brutal murder? Yeah, I think it's where you see offenders who are already at a state of anger and aggression routine in life. They're committing a burglary, they're up and they're right at the high level. It doesn't take much for them to slip into aggression and violence, particularly if they're challenged. Or so violence is classified as either being reactive or instrumental. So reactive, reactive violence is where somebody at the moment just loses their temper and they can't control their emotions. Whereas to me, this seems that both men committed instrumental murders. So to them, it made sense that they would end somebody's life just so they could get away with the burglary, which just shows how warped their moral compasses must have been. And um, what is it about the vulnerability of the elderly that um, escalated this from mere burglary to murder? I think they probably felt that they could just get away with it. It's much easier to overpower and kill their victim if they're elderly and if they're vulnerable. They're likely to be many burglaries that they were never arrested for, never never charged with. Um, and the, the, on this occasion, no, things happened and, they, and it was an aggravated burglary. They reacted to a situation and killed somebody. Stephen Unwin and William McFall have both committed cowardly, vicious murders against vulnerable, elderly people. Fate has thrown them together in the same cell, in the same prison. Could this lay the foundation for an even more horrific crime? Stephen Unwin and William McFall both grow up committing serious crimes. In the late 90s, both men murder vulnerable old age pensioners in their own homes in a cruel and violent manner. Unwin and McFall are now in HMP Swaleside, a secure category B prison on the Isle of Sheppey. It's home to some of the most dangerous murderers in the country. It's one of the main centres for lifers who are starting a life sentence and, and they were cellmates um, in that prison. Swaleside has had a, a mixed bag of attacks on prisoners. Most prison time is very boring time. You're living the same day over and over and over again. And then there's moments of high drama. Somebody getting stabbed. There's uh, an assault on a, a prison officer. Um, somebody's been had their drug stash found and they, they kick off. Or, or there's a suicide or, or, or there's a killing. Against this backdrop of boredom and violence, Unwin and McFall become friends. You don't make a lot of friends in prison, but you do make alliances. Some of the personalities gravitate towards each other. You're sharing a cell. If you don't, then it's not a very pleasant place to be, you know, so yes, and they would build friendships. The question has to be asked. Should two violent men who committed such similar crimes have been put in a cell together? The allocation of prisoners into cells would be done on a risk assessment process. Cell share risk assessment, CSRA. If they were high risks on a, on a CSRA, they would be reviewed on, on a regular basis to see whether they needed to stay in a single cell or not. As men who preyed on the old and vulnerable, Onwen and McFall posed little physical risk to each other. But the risk assessment system does not take into consideration the psychological effects of putting them together. In the case of Unwin and McFall, it is a friendship that has danger written all over it and would eventually have tragic consequences. Unwin and McFall are close prison buddies, but could they be indulging each other in their tales of violence and in doing 
After 12 years inside, the two murderers and firm friends become eligible for parole. Unwin and McFall would have been offered rehabilitation programs designed to give them insight into their offending. As well as anger management courses, thinking skills programs and job training courses to set them on the path to freedom. A tariff is just a guide, so that will be their minimum that they will have to serve, but then they will have to address behavioural issues. So he will have to have admitted guilt, and he will have to have addressed offending behaviour, and if he doesn't do that, they'll just deny him parole. In terms of their access within the prison service to rehabilitation, treatment, and risk management, what's going on? There are programmes of intervention that are available. Um, so anger management programs, for example. Question has to be asked, though, whether these two men would have been motivated to really for a few hours. So if you want to get out, you've got to tick the boxes. So whether you're generally motivated or not, you'll do the courses. Rehab is voluntary, but it's in the uh, offender's interest to try and engage because when they've got a parole board hearing in the future at their earliest potential date of release, then it looks good that the parole board will be going through the dossier that be one of the factors which could lead to their early release. So each offender had effectively a minimum of 12 years to serve for murder for their respective offences, but if they wanted to get out uh, after that minimum sentence, they really have to play the game, and part of that is to sign up for rehab. And I think part of the problem is that it's really hard to know externally what somebody's internal motivations are. So differentiating somebody who's really trying to turn their life around is very hard to distinguish between somebody who's just playing the game and going along with it and has murderous intentions the whole time. Now, rehabilitation in prisons for very serious offenders and for very serious offences like murder tends to work, or at least we know that the recidivism rate for murder is quite low. So, about these two offenders. Yes, my experience as a probation officer is having worked with lots of lifers, most of them, I felt fairly confident that they are genuinely committed to settling down into society and living pro-social lives. For the majority of people that have committed a murder, the majority of the time, rehabilitation does work. The problem is when it doesn't, like in cases like this, the results can be catastrophic. Onwen and McFall both appeared to cooperate with rehabilitation programs and managed to persuade the parole board that their reform Anyone who's working towards release will work their way through the prison system. Wherever he is, he will reduce categories. And then for someone who's that length of time, he will spend a period of time at an open prison. In another twist of fate, the two murderers reconnect while both are being prepared for release from a jail in East Yorkshire. The parole board is made up of a range of individuals who have experience of the criminal justice process. They look at the risk of releasing the offender. So based upon psychological reports, you know, what's been achieved in prison, courses, the single question really for the parole board is whether the offender remains a risk to the public. If yes, that person will not be released. If no, not a risk, then in effect, the parole board are required to release. McFall gets out in 2010 after serving 14 years. Unwin is released two years later, having served his minimum term of 12 years. They are now free men. When he comes out after committing a murder, they are on life license, and it means exactly that. They are on license for life. So uh, there'll be a certain amount of time, and it will be substantial, where they will be supervised. Now, what that means is if several years down the line, they commit an offence, which may be seen as quite trivial, they've gone out and shoplifted, that will trigger the license and they're likely to end up back inside and have to go through that whole discharge process again. After his release from prison, Unwin begins a relationship from which he has a child. It appears to the authorities that he's now on the straight and narrow and really trying to turn his life around. He resumed a relationship with someone that he dated when he was a teenager. She became convinced that he turned his life around and that he was genuinely properly rehabilitated. That's what she thought at the time, and she was happy to give him the benefit of the doubt. Unwin also manages to convince the probation service that he is a changed man. They appeared to want to know that he was in a settled environment, 
but not anything beyond that. There was there was there seemed to be checks that what this manipulative man was telling them was true and correct. They took him on his word, which initially wasn't a problem, but it, of course it became a problem later down, later down the line. Probation officers should be making regular home checks on Unwin, but that's not happening. This is the first mistake by the probation service. During his five-year relationship with his girlfriend, she was later to say that, as far as she was aware, there was no visits from any probation happening during a major shakeup of the probation system called Transforming Rehabilitation that starts in 2014. In normal circumstances, I would say it was totally unacceptable for there not to be a home visit. But I think you have to understand the exceptional uh, terms and confusion that Transforming Rehabilitation caused and the dangers to the public that it caused. Without close supervision, Unwin's behaviour deteriorates. He starts making threats against women. One of these was in relation to a complaint by a woman. Message from Unwin threatening to smash her jaw in and take turns with his cousin to rape her. Sadly, this was just one of many complaints against Unwin. After his release from prison, police logged 26 separate red flags against him. If somebody is making those sorts of threats, then uh, clearly they're not fit to be released and uh, action should be taken to ensure that they are uh, kept in secure um, conditions. Uh, whether they should have done or not, obviously they need to be making home visits, understanding the, the nature of the relationship. While well, probation would have been delighted that uh, Unwin is showing some comfort in the stability of partner and child, he still is committing offences and um, breaching his licence. What's going on in his mind? It could be that at, the t at that moment in time, he's not necessarily invested in the threats that he's making. It could just be his way of discharging frustration. Or it could be a gradual build-up of an intention to offend that hasn't quite come out yet, but it will do further down the line. It does appear that basically... I think part of the problem to know if somebody's truly rehabilitated during their time in prison is that you can only look at their behavior in prison. Once they've left prison, they've got access to so much more opportunities for crime, vices, potential victims. So it's more than feasible that Unwin at the point of release really was, at least in his own mind, insightful. And he wanted to lead a straight and narrow path. But when he had these opportunities, for example, sending out threatening messages on social media, and there was no consequence to that, Maybe over time it emboldened him to... Uh, whether they should have done or not, obviously they need to be making home visits, understanding the, the nature of the relationship. While well, probation would have been delighted that uh, Unwin is showing some comfort in the stability of partner and child, he still is committing offences and um, breaching his licence. What's going on in his mind? It could be that at, the t at that moment in time he's not necessarily invested in the threats that he's making. It could just be his way of discharging frustration or it could be a gradual build-up of an intention to offend that hasn't quite come out yet but it will do further down the line it does appear that basically i think part of the problem to know if somebody's truly rehabilitated during their time in prison is that you can only look at their behavior in prison once they've left prison they've got access to so much more opportunities for crime vices potential victims so it's more than feasible that Unwin, at the point of release, really was, at least in his own mind, insightful. And he wanted to lead a straight and narrow path. But when he had these opportunities, for example, sending out threatening messages on social media, and there was no consequence to that, maybe over time it emboldened him to the degree that he thought he could get away with things. Unwin's apparently stable relationship may be keeping a lid on his worst impulses. When that relationship comes to an end, the brakes are off. He reconnects with prison buddy McFall with disastrous consequences. Out on license, Stephen Unwin is still Although he comes to the attention of police on numerous occasions, the probation service 
is never notified. Stephen Unwin is now living at St. Oswald's Terrace in a small village in Houghton Le Spring. His apparently stable home life comes crashing down when his partner catches him texting other women. She leaves him after five years and now he's on his own and looking for company. Stephen Unwin's relationship comes to an end, so he decides to meet up with his old prison pal, William McFall. McFall heads northeast to stay with Unwin, and they start working together as handymen. Almost certainly that would be a breach of their licensing conditions for them, two convicted murderers, to be mixing together, living together, working together. Certainly they should be, that should be flagged up as a warning sign for the probation service, but it appears that it wasn't. Once again, the system fails to pick up on an alarming development. Two violent murderers who shared a cell for many years in prison are once again living together. The two men are fixing up houses for landlords. But it's not long before they get involved in drug crime. Some of the properties that um, McFall and Unwin would go and renovate or make fit again some of them had been used as cannabis farms. They would sometimes try and steal the crops and sell them on. Under each other's influence, Unwin and McFall descend back into their warp zone of burglary. McFall even films himself on his cell phone waving a gun around. The pair are a ticking time bomb. In the course of his work as a handyman, Unwin gets to know a young Vietnamese woman called Quinn Nock Wang, a London School of Commerce graduate who has come to the Northeast to live with her sister. She helped members of the Vietnamese community find accommodation and rent properties. So it would be in his role as a handyman showing people around vacant houses that he came to her. Quinn and her sister Quing run a successful nail salon in the area. Our reason for coming to the UK was the same as everyone else's. The UK is a nice, safe place where we thought we'd have a better life for ourselves and for our children. Quinn was a mother of two and a much loved member of her community. She had many friends who loved her dearly because she was a very honest and truthful person. That's why people gravitated towards her. Quinn believes Unwin to be a good man. There is no way for her to know the true risk he poses. The breakup of relationships after prison, particularly his first formative relationship outside of prison, that must have really rocked his world. I, I'm certain of it. Very important, powerful experience. Um, and it's, it's a real interest that uh, his reaction is to very shortly after that contact his old cellmate and, and encourage his cellmate to join him uh, and they start working together in partnership. The bonds that people build in prison, you're literally living cheek by jail 24-7. It must be very intense. And I think in this case, Unwin and McFall really bonded. They may have given each other permission to act in a certain way. So I wonder whether they are both revisiting that by rekindling their friendship. It's very feasible. I think the, the fact that they come from similar backgrounds, their original offences were very similar, they bonded with each other in prison, it's more than feasible that they discussed their offending whilst they were in prison. And now they've met each other again after all these years. They have similar warped values and outlooks on life, uh, especially if they're struggling financially, then all of, these, um, all of these circumstances together makes it very feasible they would have discussed offending. Yeah. So, Quang, when she came to Unwin's world, she must have presented as a pretty successful young woman who had come to this country with little or nothing and had done really well for herself, built herself a new life and was very active and uh, by all accounts very successful. What feelings would that have engendered in Unwin? I think unfortunately the fact that she looked relatively successful 
um, possibly look, looked like she had um, some savings and she was relatively rich might have made her a target. So I think that might have uh, gone noticed and, and gone into the radar of Unwin before. In this woman for some four months, they worked together. She would have no reason to fear him at, at the stage when he uh, decided to commit this offence. What I think is quite interesting about both of these characters is in the past, they've chosen vulnerable victims, so they've attacked elderly people. And I wonder whether they thought of Quen as being potentially quite vulnerable. They already had some sort of a friendship or relationship with her, which would have um, eased them into her life. So she would have been an e easy target to a degree. Unwin and McFall have a history of robbing and violently killing vulnerable people. As the pair's relationship develops outside prison, they return to their old ways with devastating consequences. This time the victim is no elderly neighbour, but mother of two, Quinn, who is completely unaware of the pair's terrible past. On August 14, 2017, Stephen Unwin calls Quinn and asks her to attend a meeting that evening to discuss a rental property. At 6 p.m., McFall texts Unwin to inquire if they're going to rape Quinn. Twelve minutes later, Quinn leaves work from the neighborhood. <laughs> At about 6.30, quarter to 7, I called her to see if she was coming home for dinner. She said, you go ahead, I need to do something. Quinn arrives at Unwin's house in St. Oswald's Terrace at 7.24 p.m. His neighbor's CCTV shows she suspects nothing. Gwen must have trusted Stephen Unwin. She went round to the property where he was. Property. He gestures to McFall, who's in the house, telling him to get out of the way, because he doesn't want her to be spooked if she sees two men. Unwin then unlocks the gate, lets her in, and that's the last time she's seen alive. As soon as she's inside, the pair set upon the young mother of two. Quen was in the house for around about four hours. Nobody knows for sure exactly what happened to her apart from the two people who are still alive, Unwin and McFall. But it's obvious that she went through a horrific, degrading ordeal at the house of psychopaths. The two men torture her to extract the PIN number for her bank card. During this horrific ordeal, Unwin rapes Quinn. So there was a, a double motive. There was a sexual motive and a motive of financial greed. So they were, they were, they were intent on, on doing both from the outset. In the middle of the attack, Unwin goes out to the local shops armed with Quinn's bank card. He withdraws £500 from her bank account, buys a bottle of whiskey and returns to McFall. Over a course of several hours, um, they, they carried out some horrific, degrading things on her. Um, they injected her with a syringe full of whiskey at one stage. And at one point, they even ate a curry while she was lying lifeless on the floor in the last stages of her life. At 11.44, the CCTV captures the men carrying Quinn out to her own car. They wrapped her in a sheet, put her in the back seat of her car and drove off to some allotments near lonely and secluded allotments in pitch black that they dumped the car with her in it on the back seat and torched it. And pathologists say that she was probably still alive when they set fire to the car. The two of them then walk back to Unwin's house in Shiny Row. When you look at the CTTV, they look like they've not got a care in the world. They're just walking along the street like two blokes coming back from the pub. And later that night, they go back to the cash point and get some more money out. And it's on the drive there that William McFall poses for a selfie in the car with Unwin driving him. And he's got this chilling grin on his face. And it's quite 
striking that he's smiling in a picture just hours after murdering this poor woman. The next morning, Quinn's sister is desperately worried she hasn't come home. At about eight o'clock when it was time to go to work, I thought, even if you didn't come home last night, you should at least have called. That's when I started worrying. At 3 p.m. on August 15th, Quang gets the worst possible news. We received a phone call from the police saying they found my sister's car. Can you please come home urgently? Police investigate Quinn's last movements by tracing her bank card transactions. It doesn't take them long to identify Stephen Unwin. They arrest him that evening and McFall shortly after. It's hard to believe that a case can be more horrific than this. Four hours of torture, rape, and then uh, being burnt alive. It's hard to imagine a worse crime than this. It beggars belief. It's absolutely shocking. And uh, it's difficult to understand how two human beings could do that to another human being. Both were convicted of murder. Was this a predictable crime? Was this a of probation? Is it possible that anyone could have conceived an outcome like this? It's, it's unlikely. I don't know that anybody could have expected such behavior. It seemed that whatever their potential for crime before their first convictions for murder, it seemed that 12, 14, 15 years on, their levels of tolerance for cruelty and pain and torture were much higher. It does seem that. And I do wonder whether they were goading each other to a degree, whether they were giving each other permission and egging each other on. And, of course, the... Two previous murders did not have a sexual element. Uh, what happened in this case? This could have been a compulsive element of the offending, um, the need for sexual gratification, or the need to have power over women, the aggression, the anger that he was feeling, possibly as a response to the breakup of his relationship. So to me, this just indicates that Unwin was looking at his victim as an object. She was just there for his sexual gratification at the time, and he wanted to make money from the situation, from the scenario. He completely lacked empathy. He didn't care about what he was doing. He didn't care about taking a life or looking into to such limited measures to try and evade capture. It seems really odd. And, and, and yes, he was super casual having a, a, a curry and taking selfies. I think they were just living in the moment. I think they just saw this as an opportunity for Unwin for sexual gratification for both of them just to, to make money easily. I don't think they were actually thinking about or planning about the future. Distilling this, what kind of person commits a crime like that? So I think the character traits of Unwin and McFall, from what we know, indicate that they must have been very impulsive. They must have not particularly learnt from their mistakes. They must have not planned for the future. They must have had a very low threshold to express aggression. And they just didn't care about the, the, the rights and the well-being of other people. They lacked shame, lacked remorse, lacked empathy and they just didn't care about breaking the law. In short, psychopaths. Thanks to multiple system failures, Unwin and McFall have escalated their violence and depravity to a whole new level. After a few short years of freedom, they are once again behind bars, awaiting trial for murder. Quinn Nock Wang while out of prison on probation. They make little effort to hide their tracks and are swiftly caught by the police. The CCTV from the property next to Stephen Unwin's house was crucial in proving their movements on the night of the murder. Ironically, Stephen Unwin had put up those cameras himself. The property belonged to his uncle and auntie and he put them up for security. What he perhaps didn't realise was that those cameras 
gave a view of a small section of his backyard. On when the pair plead not guilty and the case goes to trial at Newcastle Crown Court. The striking thing that happened there was that friends of Quen were at court. They were outside holding a photograph of her and strikingly they put a, a white sash around the top of the photograph. These white sashes are a sign of mourning and uh, uh, of loss in Vietnam. They took the photograph of her into the court itself as well and I've never seen anything like that before and it's really quite poignant. <laughs> I couldn't feel anything at that point, but I didn't want to look them in the eye. I just thought, how could you do these things to my sister? The defence for Unwin blamed the other. So McFall was to say that Unwin had carried out the murder and he wasn't there when it happened, and vice versa. Both were trying to use what's called a cutthroat defence where you blame your co-accused. Quinn's murder is so horrific that the judge allows their previous murder convictions to be put before the jury as bad character evidence. Once the bad character evidence was before the jury, any lingering doubts they may have had were, would have evaporated, I'm sure. They only deliberated for four hours before finding both men guilty on win of rape as well. Mr Justice Morris made lengthy sentencing remarks. He called Stephen Unwin calculating and manipulative and a ruthless killer. And he said, William McFall, he said he was a violent man capable of monstrous behaviour. This time, the judge is not risking these two murderers ever walking free again. He sentences both men to life without the possibility of parole. Unwin and McFall will die in prison. Outside court, Quinn and a heartfelt statement. Today I am relieved that these men will now spend the rest of their lives in prison. They don't deserve freedom. It breaks my heart that I will never see Quinn again, but the result today does give us some justice. She was a devoted mother and an, and an amazing sister who we will remember the beautiful smile forever. In May 2019, a coroner's inquest begins to discover why so many opportunities were lost to recall Unwin and McFall back to prison before they committed another violent murder. In particular, they were looking at how Unwin and McFall were able to associate with one another and whether anything could have been done to stop that and whether anything could have been done to prevent the tragic outcome for Quinn. Of particular concern to the coroner, are the 26 red flags police log against Unwin. One in particular stands out, Unwin's threat over social media to rape and beat a woman. The victim contacted the police to say that this threat had been made. Police attended. She didn't want to pursue the case, but she did tell him that he was a murderer on life license. So this went on a police log that he'd threatened to rape someone. But it wasn't flagged up to the probation service, so they didn't get to know about it, but it, it was on the police log. And then, within six weeks, he carried out the rape and murder of Quen. The coroner uncovers a shocking lack of communication between the police and the probation service. There had been a system of flags and markers where every incident of that type would be flagged up to the probation service. Now, that, that began in 2013, police officers involved was, was swamping them. The coroner concludes, life license is based on trust and having heard evidence, it is clear to me that both Unwin and McFall broke that trust consistently and were emboldened in all of their unlawful activities by what they must have perceived as the failures on the part of the authorities to expose their deceit. <laughs> Nhà nước ấy, 
Whether it's police or probation, whoever is in charge of these things, they should not let dangerous All back behind bars serving life. Well, what can we now learn from this tragic event? Do you think the lessons from the failings that contributed to this terrible crime have been learned? I hope so. Uh, the, the, the probation service has certainly indicated that they would respond positively to the coroner's letter and uh, the police service similarly. I think part of the problem is that when you have an investigation and when light is shone in gaps in the system, then due to embarrassment, due to public outcry, things are fixed and there's a lot more attention in that one service. But over time, things can become lax again. And as you say, the problem is this, this kind of incident is so rare that when there is lapses in communication, when people aren't following up prisoners as much as they should, the vast majority of the time, there's, there's no deadly consequence. So these mistakes. The about this case is that this was not a crime that was inevitable, that was waiting to happen. Uh, because for a great uh, deal of the management of this case, it appeared to be managed quite well. Yes, and that's a learning point in itself, that it doesn't necessarily follow that if things seem to be going swimmingly or reasonably well, that you take your eye off the ball. Uh, these men needed to be managed in the community, they're lifers after all, they're, they're subject to life license. Um, that, that doesn't end, that, that remains for the rest of their lives, so there's a responsibility to maintain careful supervision. I completely agree. You cannot take your eye off the ball because people with this kind of background, especially if they, if they have very warped values and boundaries, they can offend in the future. So you can't afford to be lax. You have to always be on top of them in terms of supervision. Could this crime have been prevented? In my opinion, absolutely. I think it was Unwin's red flags. There were so many of them and they were potentially so dangerous that something should have been done. Recall should have been seriously considered at that point. Knowing what we know now, if he had been recalled for some of his 26 potential infractions, been likely, do you think he would forever have remained a danger, a potential murderer in waiting? I think what we know about him now suggests that he was a, uh, always a ticking time bomb. Who would become his next victim? We don't know. We'll never know that. It wouldn't have been that young lady would have been someone else. I've been very badly affected by her loss. For three years, my mental health has really suffered. A little better in the last year or so. She was loved, not just by my family, but by everyone who knew her. This year is the fourth anniversary of her death, and all her friends came to pay their respects. When two convicted killers released on life license meet up, how surprised should we be when they plot and perpetrate another murder? The police and probation should have kept them apart and ensured that they adhered to the conditions of the release. If that had happened,